So first I want to say that the section that we are covering tonight, resistance to boundaries, this is the longest section in the book, so this will be the, the section that I'm skipping the most out of what they say just because of the, the length of it. So there's, there's a lot more in this section than what we're going to cover tonight. So if you, uh, if you get the book, this is going to be one part where you'll see a lot more in there than what we're covering. So what we're really talking about now is when the rubber meets the road. This is when you say, I'm going to stop just talking about how boundaries are going to be good but I'm actually going to go out and uh, put some boundaries into my life. So I'm going to go up to that person in my relationship that has been controlling me and has been dominating my life, and I'm going to let them know that they're not going to manipulate me anymore. I'm going to go to that person who's been you know, scrounging money off me in a way that I cannot afford and let them know that my savings account is not going to be their checking account any longer. Um, or I'm going to seek help with my own boundary issue in my own heart, my own relationship with God, and ask someone help me to be able to walk with proper internal boundaries or proper boundaries in my relationship with God. So we're going to talk about what happens when you do that and the resistance that you will receive to those boundaries. Because resistance to the establishment of boundaries comes in two different ways. It comes with outside resistance, that is resistance from others, and then also internal resistance, and that is the reluctance we have in our own heart and in our own mind to setting up boundaries. So we're going to talk about three forms of external resistance and four forms of internal resistance. So the by far most common response that you'll receive if you try to start establish boundaries that affect the lives of other people, uh, easily the most uh, likely response is going to be the response of anger. Because if someone has been taking advantage of you for years and you're letting them know that you will no longer be theirs to control, it is going to make them angry. And we need to be prepared for the fact that they will be angry. And the most common way that people respond in their anger when we try to establish boundaries is that they say things about the person who is setting up boundaries that are categorically untrue. So they will speak lies about you and you need to be prepared for that because you don't want any of those lies to sink in as, oh, is what they're saying about me true? So if you have been irresponsible with your boundaries by giving money to a friend or loved one that you should not, uh, you've been giving them hard-earned money, hard money that you have earned in order to enable their bad behavior, suddenly you decide to keep that money for yourself, they're going to respond by you keeping your own money with, how could you be so selfish? When they're the one who's trying to take from you what you have earned. So... You can't be called selfish for keeping what it is that you've earned, but someone is obviously selfish if they want to get their fingers on what you've earned. So you need to see how illogical these angry accusations can be. And that's what you need to tell yourself when people are saying these lies, is you need to be able to say, okay, that's not true. I'm not really being selfish here. Like, this is not the right thing, so that you won't immediately respond to them with, yeah, maybe I am being a little selfish, and then continue to enable their unhealthy behaviors. We need to remember that angry responses to healthy boundaries is not something about you, but it is a sign that the other person has a character problem. So the person who responds with anger, their anger is not your fault. Your anger is their fault. And it will only in any way be your fault if you give in to their anger and then enable them to continue with the bad behavior that resulted in their anger because then you are teaching them, if you're angry toward me, the result will be, I'm going to give you what you want. So the only way their anger is your responsibility is if you respond to their anger by affirming their anger and their illogical behaviors. Now, just knowing that someone's anger is wrong and illogical does not make it any easier to bear. I don't know about you, but I, I hate being yelled at. Uh, there's been a couple of times I've been called yelled at and called cold and heartless at church for not giving people what they want. And no matter how much I know their accusation is wrong and it is illogical and what they're saying about me is not true, still it 
it's not easy to hear. No one wants to be yelled at and told that they're a selfish, heartless person. So for that reason, if you have any expectation at all that someone is going to respond to your boundaries with anger, the first thing that you need to do is you need to get support in establishing those boundaries. Support from someone who will speak logic to you before and after the encounter, or ideally maybe someone who will stand next to you and give you a safety net while you feel that boundary come upon you. Ideally, uh, we would love to have it set up so that if you're someone who's establishing boundaries for the first time, you could even get a small group of four or five people uh, who could speak a majority to your life. You know, the Bible talks about the importance of two or three witnesses, so it'd be better to have multiple witnesses speak to you against the angry accusations of someone else. So you need to find help if someone is going to be angry against you. And then the second thing that is just as important as finding help is you need to go into this encounter ensuring that you are not going to allow yourself to respond to their anger with more of your own anger. We do not want to respond with an eye for an eye. We are told by Christ that we are to love our enemies. We are even to love those who hatefully use us. The goal of boundaries is not to destroy relationships. The goal of boundaries is to make relationships healthier. And very often, if someone is angry because of your boundaries, you respond in kind with anger, then that will bring uh, destruction and ruin to your relationship. And if you present your new boundaries to someone and they respond with anger and you feel like you're going to blow up, you just need to be ready to, to leave. Leave the area. We talked about the importance of one of the ways of power we have in situations is the power of space, to be able to walk away and remove ourselves from that person so we do not fall into the trap of anger. So the first resistance to boundaries is anger. The second one is guilt messages. So their illustration in the book is a man telephones his mother, and when he calls mom, she answers the phone really, really weak and, and sick, and it sounds like she just she, she must be, be doing terrible and, and concerned that his mom's sick. Uh, the son asks, mother, what's wrong with you? And she responds with, I guess my voice doesn't even work very well anymore since, since no one has called me since you've left home. Few weapons hit harder and sting longer than the weapon of guilt from a controlling person. And one sign that you have weak boundaries is that you will allow the guilt messages of others to go into your ears and then sink into your heart and sit there and then dictate your behaviors. And so what we want to do um, right now is go through a suggested list of guilt messages that people deliver. And we want to do this for two reasons. One, be prepared for when other people are guilting you that this is what they're doing. Some people have been guilted so much in their life that when people do it, they don't even see that they're being manipulated because they don't see anything wrong with these type of statements. And second, when you hear these statements, you also should internally be thinking, do I say these kind of things to other people? Am I a guilt manipulator? Because we don't want to be these people either. Uh, so here are some examples of guilt messages. Uh, one is, uh, how could you do this to me after everything I have done for you? Or it seems that you could think about someone other than yourself for once. If you loved me, you would do this for me. It seems like you could care enough about your family to do just this one thing that I want, this one time. And of course, it's never the one thing, the one time, but uh, how could you abandon your family by acting like this? Don't you remember what happened the last time you didn't listen to me? You know, if I had what you had, I'd give it to somebody who is in need like I am. You have no idea how much I would sacrifice for you. Or they could get spiritual with these messages. How can you do this and call yourself a Christian? I've had that when people come asking for money. Like that's probably the most common response. How can you even say you're a church? Doesn't the Bible say you need to honor your parents? I thought Christians were supposed to think of others before themselves. Or last, uh, you must have a real spiritual problem 
to act like this. And people say these kind of things because they want you to feel guilty about the choices that you are making. They are trying to make you feel bad about how you manage your time, your skills, and your finances. And some of these hit home because if we're honest, the Bible teaches us that we're to give. We are not to be self-centered, but the thing that the Bible also does not say is the Bible does not say you need to give to people whatever they want whenever they want it. We are to control our giving. We're to be in such control of our giving when we help other people and we give to the church that our giving can be called cheerful giving. And one sign that we are being guilted into giving in a way that we should not be giving is if we cannot give cheerfully. So if you feel guilty while you're giving to someone else, that's a sign that your giving is not appropriate. The Bible never recommends guilt-induced giving. If you can't give cheerfully, if you are overburdened as you give, it may be a sign that someone is manipulating and controlling your boundaries. So how do we overcome these guilt messages? First and foremost, we recognize what they are. And that is they are a form of abuse and control. You are being abused to to go against your will and into the will of another. So don't rationalize the manipulation of others when they guilt you and say, oh, it's not that bad. That's just how they are. Well, yeah, that might be how they are, but that doesn't mean it is appropriate and good behavior. Uh, Second, we need to recognize the condition by which, the state by which people typically communicate guilt messages. Uh, Recognize that often people are guilting others because they are coming from a place of sadness and hurt. Typically, the people who resort to this type of guilt manipulation are people who are struggling with fear, loneliness, and longings that they just cannot handle on their own. And so they're trying to take their struggles and put them on your shoulders. And this is where we need to think in our responses, where we've talked before about the difference between harm and hurt. It's okay to respond in a way that that hurts them because you're not giving them what they want, but you shouldn't respond in a calloused way that is harmful toward the person who's trying to guilt you because, like I said, most often they have a serious need. They're just trying to meet it in the wrong way. So we need, if we need to hurt them with their guilting, we need to do so in a way that would help them to move to a better place in their own life. Uh, The third way to respond to someone with guilt messages is to point out to them that their problems are their problems and not your problems. Their debt is their spending issue and not your lack of compassion issue. Their loneliness is because they haven't sought out other healthy relationships. No one should lean on a single person or a single friendship to such an extent where they would say to that one person, if you don't give me what I need for you, then I will be utterly lonely. If they need to lean on you that much, that's because they have not been responsible to go out and seek the friendship of others and love their neighbors as themselves, love those in a church community as they should be. And so their loneliness is not your problem, but it's their problem for not establishing the relationships they should have had in their life to make them so dependent upon you. Uh, The fourth thing with someone who guilts you, and I thought this this was great advice, is that the one thing you should not do when someone guilts you is explain yourself or justify your actions before them. They do not need to know why you are spending your money or your time the way that you do. So about once each year, uh, I will buy the new Mario game for the Nintendo. So they typically come out with a different type of Super Mario Brothers game each year, and I, I get the newest one. And I get it for myself, even though my kids play it far more than I do, but I always get that newest one. And and easily someone could come up to me if they knew I bought a Mario game and guilt me and say, you spent $50 on a Nintendo game, how could you not help me with my electric bill? Well, I don't need to explain to them how I spend my money. I earn my 
paycheck by working for the church and how I choose to spend it is, is how I spend it. That is not the response of that. Is my, I'm not responsible to explain to anybody else how I spend my finances, even if it is something as dumb as a Nintendo game. And you need to understand that you are not responsible to explain your spending choices, how you spend your time. Um, if you want to go to golf every Saturday morning, that's between you and the Lord and the people you golf with. You do not need to justify that to the person who is trying to guilt you into your behavior. Because as soon as you try to explain yourself or justify yourself to someone who is trying to guilt you, what you are tacitly saying to that person is, you are in a place to judge me. You are in a place to rule over my life. So I do need to explain my spending or my time habits with you when you don't, you don't owe that to them. Probably the only person that you should explain that information to is your spouse and to God. You don't owe that explanation to any other person, so do not allow someone to guilt you and where you need to explain and justify your actions to them. And then next is the by far most difficult response to boundaries, and that is physical resistance. This is the most difficult to discuss, but it is necessary. Some people cannot maintain their boundaries with another person because they are physically overpowered. So this is abusive spouses who won't take no for an answer. Elderly parents who are abused by adult children or caretakers. And the key for abused individuals is that if you're someone in a physical resistance situation, you must seek you need to find outside helpers who will stand beside you and protect you from the physical abuse of others. And you need to remember that if by seeking help before the person who is abusing you, and if as a result of seeking that help, that other person is shamed or even imprisoned because of their abuse against you, their shame, their imprisonment is not your fault. It is not your problem because you went and sought help, but this is the natural consequence of their physical abuse. They have reaped abuse, and now they have sown abuse, saying it backwards, they have sown abuse, and now they are reaping the consequences of shame and judgment and possible imprisonment. They are the ones who ruined the family, the marriage, or the or the friendship with their physical attacks and intimidation. So the person who, has go, who, the person who goes for help is the victim. They are not the cause of the heartbreak if the abuse becomes public. So if you are experiencing physical resistance, the first place that you need to go before you even attempt to speak your boundaries is to find help from others. And depending upon the level of the abuse depends upon the... Um, the level to which you're going to go to seek that help. Does it need to be law enforcement? Can it just be a friend? And also numbers help, and probably by going to friends, they can help you know if you should go to law enforcement over the physical abuse you have been seeking. And also, if someone comes and seeks your help who is in an abusive situation, the first thing you need to understand is how difficult it typically is for a person to report physical abuse from a loved one. The vast majority of physical abuse cases in the world are not from strangers. They are not from neighbors that we barely know. It is from our closest loved ones. And one of the reasons people can get away with abusing those who are closest to them is that we are always hesitant to bring forward an accusation of guilt upon someone we love. Therefore, if someone comes forward to anyone in the church and says, I'm experiencing this physical abuse, we need to understand they probably had to overcome a mountain of objections to finally speak that truth. So the last thing that we should ever do is belittle them, shrug it off, act like it's a big deal, think that it might typically go away. 
if it is bad enough that they will speak about it and seek help from you, it is typically a situation where we need to be as active and engaged and maybe pull in as much outside other help as possible to be for that person uh, the assistance and the encouragement that they need in physical, physical resistance. So really the key to understanding how to respond to the physical resistance uh, part of boundaries is that you do not take this alone. You do not try to establish boundaries with someone who has threatened physical abuse or has a history of physical abuse. You must do this in the midst of community in order to make sure that you remain protected. Now at this point, as we transition from outside resistance to inside resistance, what we want to talk about for a moment is forgiveness and reconciliation. Because there's going to be a lot of hurt. There's going to be a lot of damaged relationships as a result of setting up boundaries. If you have people who are accusing you of being selfish and terrible and not a Christian, and they're going to be angry and they're going to be slinging insults at you, it's going to damage your relationship. And it's going to require forgiveness and it's going to require reconciliation. So we want to talk about the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. So the Bible is clear about two principles when it comes to restoring relationships that are broken apart because of the establishment of boundaries. And that is one, we always need to forgive others. And then second, we will not always be able to achieve reconciliation. We always need to forgive because forgiveness is our heart's response, our inner spirit's response to the wrongs of others. So forgiveness is releasing someone of the debt that they owe you. So you write off their debt to say, I am no longer going to condemn you. You are clean in my eyes. Now that does not mean that we are not going to require someone at time to pay the consequences for what they have sowed. Uh, if someone has been physical abusive to the point where they need to be going to prison, we're not going to prevent that from happening. But it means that we're no longer going to see that person as the offender in our eyes again. So the person who wrongs you, uh, they don't even need to ask for forgiveness for you to be able to give it. Uh, forgiveness is grace to the undeserving. But reconciliation is not forgiveness. Reconciliation requires both parties. Reconciliation requires the removal of what caused the division so that peace can be made between the two parties. Typically, what reconciliation requires is of the offended party to act on behalf of that, that person who was the victim. So if you're the victim, you offer the forgiveness. If you're the one who caused the offense, you should be the one to do the act to bring about reconciliation. And that act that is required of you to bring about the reconciliation is the act of repentance. And that is where you turn from the action that caused the divide from the relationship, and then you move into a place of righteousness. So when it comes to our relationship with God as Christians, just as an example of how this works, our relationship with God is always one where, from God's perspective, he is willing to give forgiveness to his people all day long. The scriptures tell us that if we confess our sins, what will be the answer if we confess our sins and go before God? He will be faithful and just to forgive us of our sins because God's loving compassion his grace, his mercy is always will far outstrip anything we would ever think possible of our God. God is willing to forgive us. But if we want to move into that place where we are once again having a, a healthy fellowship and walking relationship with God, well, from our perspective, that requires repentance. That requires for us to not only say, uh, yes, I'm confessing my sin and it was wrong. I should not have said those lies in order to make myself look better than I am. So I'm going to walk away from that lie and speak the truth. And typically the sign that you are walking away from your lies and speaking the truth is that you'll go up to those people that you lied about and said, you know, sorry I lied. I said something that wasn't true and now I'm going to speak the truth. So God expects us to forgive those who have wronged us, but he doesn't expect us to reconcile with the other party unless that person who has caused the 
uh, harm or the hurt is willing to repent. And repentance is both the idea of confessing, uh, admitting that what you did was wrong. It's that change of mind. And scripturally, with the change of mind, always comes the change of behavior. So we need to see that behavioral change as well. And so biblically, if we see the change of view that what they did was wrong, we see the behavior change, God calls on us at that point to reconcile with those who have wronged us. So that means they stop their manipulating behavior. They are no longer angry uh, when we establish our boundaries. And at that point, we can reconcile to them. But if that person's going to continue in their same pattern of anger, in that same pattern of trying to guilt you, it would not be healthy for you to reconcile with that person. Uh, but we should, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, hand that person over to Satan, which allows them to experience the fruits of their behavior. So now let's talk about internal resistance. So these are your problems that you're going to have with setting up boundaries. Uh, the first form of internal resistance that you have is human need. And this means you need humans. God desires us to need people. Uh, what did God say when Adam was by himself? God did not say, oh, Adam, you got me. And then you got all these animals that you get to name. You should be thrilled to be in this world. No, God said it's not good for Adam to be alone. And it is not good for us to be alone. And since we need people, all too often we allow people to trample our boundaries, to intimidate us into silence because we are afraid of being alone. Many people struggle with this if they grew up in families where they did not experience unconditional love where they were clearly ignored and shut out from their parents if they did not act in the way that their parents want them to, so they feel like they always need to perform in order to have the love of others. And the best way to overcome the barrier to establishing the boundary of human needs is to take the responsible action to establish more friendships in your life. Because again, if you're hanging on to one friend, and that's you feel like that's all you got. And if you lost that one person, you would be utterly alone. Well, it's your responsibility to have a wider range of friendships in the church, in your family, in your community, so that you are not tied in an unhealthy way to someone who is seeking to tear, your tear you down and manipulate you. So if you have the resistance of human need, I just need that person even though they are abusing me. The best way to overcome this is to take the responsibility to have more deep, healthy friendships and relationships. Second is unresolved grief and loss. Many times setting up boundaries causes us to risk losing a relationship with someone we love. To start to set up a boundary with someone you love who at the same time physically abuses you, that's going to expose everything and bring it right out in the open. And there's a decent chance that that relationship is going to be gone. And even if it is abusive, a lot of people still lean upon those people and that, that hurts. And what I found interesting is that what they talk about doing in order to overcome this, this, this grief over, I might lose this relationship if I st establish healthy boundaries, is to begin to grieve in advance to grieve before you establish that boundary, to experience the loss before you go to that person who you believe will reject you if you begin to live in a healthy way, to overcome that hurt already because that person has destroyed the relationship. That person has ruined it. And so sometimes we need to confess that relationships already died because of that person's manipulation and greed and abuse of me, and I need to confess that the relationship's over. I need to weep over it. I need to grieve over it so that I can then go and set up boundaries in a way where I won't crumble over the potential loss that will come from those boundaries. Uh, so how do we face this difficult issue on top of this is, um, first, you need to own your own boundarylessness. Admit that you have a, a a pattern of not establishing boundaries, admit that you're being controlled by others, 
and that you have a problem with a lack of boundaries. Uh, second, when you're going to establish these grieving type of boundaries is realize the resistance and realize the resistance. Confess that you're afraid of this loss. Confess that you're afraid of this grief and what's going to be caused by these boundaries being put up and put this out into the open of your own heart. And ideally, if you're going to go through this process of confessing um, your boundary issues, confessing your, um, your struggles and your resistance and your grief, that you'll find someone you can do this with. So find someone else that you can seek grace and truth with. Let them know, unburden your struggles upon them, and allow them to help you move into healthier relationships. The third form of resistance is one that we pretty much hit on a little bit in the first point, and that is anger. How do you deal with your own anger toward others? Because if you realize, like if you went through that guilt list and you thought, oh man, there is somebody in my life who has said five of these things on this list and they're saying them all the time, guilt me into things that I don't want to do, it could make you angry. And so how do you deal with your own angry anger toward others? Uh, first, realize that you have an anger problem. Second, uh, no one, second is find the source of your anger. Uh, normally, we're angry over things that we're afraid of, things that hurt us, goals that we have that are frustrated. Third, find someone who will hold you accountable for your own anger. Find someone that you can talk to when you're angry, someone you can be angry to in order to unleash those pent-up emotions who can handle feeling it, uh, but they are not the direct result of that. And then I think the fourth and most important thing to keep in mind when it comes to our own internal anger is that when you go to that person who's going to be angry toward you, do not act on autopilot. When someone else lets their monster out, don't let your monster out as well. Don't respond in kind. So often the terrible thing about anger is that anger goes with anger. And a lot of the issues with boundaries in families is that typically those anger problems run in the family. And so you have one person who gets angry with another. I got this series of books that I've used for a bunch of sermon illustrations uh, written by a guy named Leland Gregory. And all he does is for these books is basically compile these crazy news stories. And he's got one book called Cruel and Unusual Idiots. And it's surprising how many of those stories are just an ang uh, argument erupts in a family over something just absolutely stupid. And then you find one family member shooting another one, or, or I think one was a family member hit another in the face with a, with a juvenile alligator, uh, just doing crazy stuff over these petty things because one person gets angry, then another person does, and it escalates. So when it comes to anger, don't go on autopilot. If you feel like the anger is coming, get out of there. And then the fourth and maybe most difficult form of internal resistance is fear of the unknown. Fear of the unknown. Because the one thing about establishing healthy boundaries is that having healthy boundaries could change everything. I mean, what would your life look like if you practiced healthy boundaries in all of your relationships with your family, your friend, and your church. And here's the honest answer. If you began to live with healthy boundaries, what's it going to look like? I don't know. No one knows because no one knows how other individuals will respond to your boundaries. How will a spouse respond if you tell them we need to start living according to a budget? How will your sister respond if you tell her that she keep, can't keep coming and asking you for money each week? Maybe you'll establish these boundaries and things will be so much improved. You'll set up a budget for your family and your finances will be free as it never has been before. You'll set up boundaries on your time and then all of a sudden both you and even others in your family will live more responsible because you're living in a schedule and using your time in a better manner. Things could be great. 
And to be honest, if you're able to get through this fix, friction of establishing the boundaries and maintain these relationships, things will improve. But we got to be honest that you could go to establish boundaries and it could be horrible. You could tell someone that you don't want them to walk all over you anymore, and their response may be, well, then I'm never going to walk near you again. You could cut off someone who has been draining your finances dry, only to find that they dive into something far worse than your finances. And those unknowns can be paralyzing. The thing we need to ask ourselves is, is there ever an inkling in the scripture of God telling us to avoid doing the right thing because it might have difficult results? No, God always wants us to walk in righteousness even in the face of fears over the unknown. Because the thing about beginning to live with boundaries in your life is that they separate you. It's a defining line point that separates you from the life that you have known to the life that God wants you to live in responsibility and diligence and potential to walk in godliness. Boundaries will open up lives to options that you never knew were available before you, for you before. And that can be encouraging, but those new options can also be a little daunting and scary. So let's talk about a few suggestions of ways to overcome fears of the unknown. Uh, suggestion number one is the most obvious in church, and that is pray. There's no better antidote to anxiety than prayer. There's an old chorus uh, that my mother sang to me a thousand times uh, when she was dealing with her own anxiety, which was, why worry when you can pray? Trust Jesus. Don't be dismayed. Don't be a doubting Thomas. Trust fully in his promise. Why worry, 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 worry when you can pray? So the first thing to do is whenever that fear of the unknown comes, bring it before God. Say, God, I'm terrified about this. I need you to handle my fears. Second is read the Bible. And read the Bible looking for two specific things as it relates to fears of the unknown. The first thing you want to look for in the Bible is the promises of God. The scriptures are filled with so, 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 so many promises from God. Uh, promises from God to carry us through the fears and the unknowns. Uh, just reading in Psalms this morning, uh, there's so many promises that God has in relation with David's life and some of his unknowns, and they're there and available for us. So look for God's promises for these unknown times. And then the second thing you want to do is not look for promises that God has made, but also look for narratives in the Bible that you can read through of other people that walked into scary and unknown and unnerving situations, and God delivered them through. I mean, probably the most uh, ready and apparent story of someone who walked into an unknown situation in the Bible is Noah. I mean, Noah started building the boat before he had ever seen a raindrop. Uh, Noah was walking into an unknown situation. His whole world was literally wiped out in a flood, uh, but God carried Noah through. The third thing that you want to do in the face of the unknown is develop your gifts. Boundaries can create a newfound independence that people can feel a little bit lost in. At times, our fear is because we were too caused is because we were too dependent upon others who were abusive in our lives. So you may need to get out there and develop some new skills, develop some new talents. You could take a class, uh, gain new information by studying into a subject, learn a skill, get counseling, get training, get some new experience. Uh, but basically, you need to, to get involved and expand yourself more and develop who you are to take advantage of this freedom that God gives you when you walk in righteousness. The fourth one is lean upon a support group. Don't walk into the unknown alone. Noah built the ark before it started raining, but Noah didn't build the ark alone. 
Noah had his family alongside him to support him. If you even look at Jesus with his ministry, if anybody could have gone it alone for his years of ministry, it was Jesus. But Jesus didn't go alone. He not only discipled the disciples, but we have multiple instances where he is using the disciples to further his own work. So find some people who will help you. Uh, If you're in a point where establishing boundaries is going to mean that you're going to need financial support, uh, find those people who will help you with your finances. Find people who will just be willing to listen to you so that you can vent about your anger when you know that other people will come at you with their anger. So a group can help you with multiple ways. So the idea is get multiple people who can help you in this fear of the unknown, uh, not one, not two, and especially do not go it alone. And then the fifth and final way to overcome the fear of the unknown is have confidence in your ability to learn. Have confidence in your ability to learn. There's no reason that you can't learn things tomorrow that you didn't know about at all today. God has given you a wonderful mind with understanding and even the Holy Spirit to help you as a guide. So who knows what you could learn the next day that's going to help you to bring you through this. I just... Uh, I thought that this was the coolest thing. I got, I got sent a letter, uh, uh, email from Greg Bagby, um, and he just showed me the coolest thing. I'll just share this because I didn't know this until today, and nobody knew this until really recently. Uh, but they made a, a discovery that the type of rock that's toward the core of the earth is a different type of rock that they never knew existed. And it's a rock that acts as a sponge and traps water inside of it. So there is this rock in the center of the earth that is filled with water. And the theory of the people who discovered these rocks, and it's a theory because getting down to where these rocks are, we don't really have the technology to really do it hardly at all. But the theory is is that the entire inside of the earth is probably made up of these water rocks. And the intriguing thing about this theory is that up until the discovery of these rocks, most scientists had a belief that the way that our planet got water for the first time was through some external source, like a comet hitting the Earth or something like that, and that's how we got water. And these scientists are like, well, if we're right about our theory with these sponge water rocks, the way we got water on top of the Earth is probably from inside of the Earth, and these are these are... This is, a, this is a secular atheist journal. And they're like, the weird thing is that the book in the Bible, that the, the historical book that talks about water coming up from the earth is the Bible. And it actually might best line up with this new discovery of these sponge rocks that are inside the earth. And so they said that if they're right about how much of the earth is made up of these rocks, there's actually more water under the surface of the earth than there is water in the ocean's around the earth. And we just learned this, like, you know, this was just, they've been working on this, this theory based on the discovery of this rock for a couple of years. This is brand new stuff. And so you can learn new things, all that to say, uh, things that we did not know yesterday, you can learn for tomorrow. Uh, A lot of dysfunctional families train their children by saying things like, you will never be better than me. You will never make anything of yourself. You will always be miserable. And God comes to us and says, no, you can always grow. You can be productive. You can do more. And I think part of the reason that people can be afraid of the unknown is because we have a feeling that how we are today is how we will be stuck being a week from now, six months from now, a year from now. And God's perspective is you can grow in immense ways over the next 12 months. So don't fear going into that new area because you can learn from it. So have confidence in your ability to learn. So there are a host of mountains to climb if you want to establish boundaries in your life. Boundaries from other people who want you to remain stuck under their influence. Boundaries of your own shame and your own fear. And the great thing about these mountains that are standing between us and our boundaries is that we worship a God who with faith the size of a mustard seed can take those mountains and throw them into the oceans. 
So let's not allow these boundaries to, these mountains to overcome us, uh, but let's be people who pray over our fears. Let's be people who recognize how other people want to manipulate us. And instead of stepping back into fear, let's step forward in the boldness to live how Christ would desire us to live.